I'm really honored to have the opportunity to present my work um, because I've been following this series with great interest and seen some fantastic talks. Um, and in particular, I believe the very first talk was by Larry Abbott and was about the circuit that I'm going to be talking about today. So some of you may remember all the way back to then. Uh, I won't be requiring you to answer any questions. Okay, so I'm going to talk about neural circuits for vector processing in the insect brain. Um, I work in a group called Insect Robotics because we try to build our hypothetical models of insect behavior as, as robot models, and I'll illustrate that a little bit today. And I'm going to focus today on, on one particular um, insect behavior, which is um, path integration. So as shown here, that an an ant, for example, can leave its nest, go on a complicated path, and then when it finds food, take a direct route back. And the reason I've shown this other picture here, this is actually what's called a traverse board. And this is how um, sailors did dead reckoning for many, many years. And it seems like insects are able to do exactly the same. So they're able to integrate um, their legs of their path and use that to keep track of where they are relative to their starting point. So what I'm hoping to cover today, I, I hope to get to the end, um, is to start with um, talking about this biologically plausible neural circuit for path integration in the insect central complex. Uh, and this is work that was done in close collaboration with Stanley Heinzer at Lund University and was a, a particular contribution was made by my student, Tom Stone. Um, and I'll be talking about one implementation done by a more recent student, Jan Stenkowitz. And then I want to also get onto how we've extended this model to explain some of the other kinds of behaviors that we see in insects. So including navigation with vector memories, which is work with Florent Lemuel and Antoine Wistract um, on integration of multimodal cues, which is current work in my lab by Roman Goulard and Robert Mitchell, and also really very speculative ideas about the dance behavior of honeybees, which is work of a current student, Anna Hajitofi. So let's start with an example of a foraging ant. I hope the video is running nicely. Um, so it's a complex natural behavior that we can examine in real field conditions. And we see, for example, this desert ant bringing food back to its nest. And for these species of ants, they don't use um, chemical trails, but each ant is navigating individually. And it's crucial that they navigate well to get back to their nest, where their nest is typically a very small hole in the ground, so something they cannot see for any, once they've moved even a short way away from it. Yet they've been observed to do this kind of behavior over very large distances, up to a kilometer, and as in this example, through complex cluttered terrain. And there's two key mechanisms, and I'm only going to really talk about one today, so the mechanisms that they've been known for a long time to use are path integration, or dead reckoning and visual memory. And we actually do some field studies on these ants. So this is just one example where we were following ants around um, with both differential GPS and a downward pointing camera. Um, so this is work particularly led by my former student and postdoc Michael Mangan. Um, and we were trying to track where ants went um, from the very first time they went out of the nest. And so the the Experimental behavior looked a little bit like this. So following these ants around um, in this particular uh, study field that we use near Seville, near Sevilla. And then we have this downward facing camera and some wonderful work by uh, postdoc Benjamin Rissa managed to track the ants from this moving camera image in this cluttered terrain so that we could try and extract their tracks. And then we also try to reconstruct to some extent what the ant point of view might be. Um, so they have low resolution vision, but they can see, for example, polarization patterns in the sky as, as I've tried to kind of visualize here what it might look like for the ant. So briefly, um, the kind of behaviors that we see is that the ant is able to do path integration of vector memory. So for example, this is an ant it's the first time the ant has come out of its nest and its first foraging excursion. Where the blob is larger, it means it's slowed down a little bit. So you can see it's, it's gradually going out and exploring its world. But when it finds some food, 
it then comes very directly back. So that's this dark orange path. It's coming back almost directly towards its nest, but it seems to know, you know, it doesn't overshoot the nest. So it also knows roughly the distance to the nest. Um, and then the second time it goes out, it doesn't go out randomly, but it actually goes back to where it found the food. So that's this second outward trip and it comes back on this second homeward trip. And you'll see that second homeward trip is actually extremely similar to the first one. Um, they also, so this first behavior is, is path integration. So on their first outward path, they're managing to keep track of where their nest is. And so they can go straight home. And they're also remembering where the food was when they got it so that they can go back out again. They are also known to use visual memory. So in this case, if we pick up the ant and put it back at the food location it's, and let it go, it's actually able to follow this path that it's seen it most twice all the way back to the nest. But I'm not actually gonna talk about that today. Um, if you're interested, we've built models of this behavior, looking at how memory in the mushroom body of the insect might be able to explain this behavior. But today I'm gonna to focus on the path integration behavior. And as I mentioned, there's been some amazing experiments in, in for example, salt pans, um, where ants have been shown to go over very long distances. And the, the classic test for, for path integration is that after they've gone out on this long distance, you pick them up and move them so that they, and you see that they run back in exactly the vector and then search at exactly the length of the of where they think they are. And what this shows is that they're not using, you know, visual cues or chemical cues or anything else. They, they're, they're just using what they know about their displacement. Um, although they can use visual cues. So as in this example, it runs all the way back, but then once it starts to search, it actually searches back towards these visual cues given um, by this bit of geography in this example. Okay, so we might say, What's the problem, okay? I mean, all you need to do to do path integration is, is just uh, integrate velocity along your journey to maintain a location estimate, the home vector. So I think one of the interesting problems is to say, well, what, what frame of reference or coordinate system should the ant be using? And this is um, examples taken from a very nice paper that I highly recommend by Vicar Staff and Chung, uh, published in 2010 where they basically talked about, well, what are the, what are the possibilities? So potentially um, the ant could use geocentric coordinates. So based on its home, it could keep track of its own position. So this is the ant's position and its, its heading angle. Um, so it could do that in geocentric coordinates or it could do it in polar coordinates. So it keeps the distance and the angle from the nest. Or it could do this in an egocentric way. So the ant at any point in time could be keeping, could know where home is relative to itself, where it basically has either Cartesian egocentric coordinates. So they're kind of aligned with its own body axis or Cartesian, sorry, uh, polar egocentric coordinates. So again, aligned with its own axis, but now expressed as an angle and a distance. And the the update equations, basically this, the equations below show what the animal has to do to update. So on each step, um, how it needs to change its estimate of its, for example, in the geocentric case of the X and the Y value as it moves. So what they discuss in this paper, what Vicar Staff and Chung discuss in this paper is why initially you might think the obvious thing for the ant to do would be to have egocentric polar coordinates, because that's basically telling it what it needs to do to get home. It needs to turn by theta and it needs to move the distance r dash in this case, theta dash and r dash. So that might, and a lot of people have assumed in the past that this is how they should be encoded in the brain. But as they point out, there's actually a few problems with, with using polar coordinates in general. Um, in particular, that as you get closer and closer to home and as r gets smaller and smaller, you have this term in the equation where you're dividing by r so that the rate of change of your angular estimate starts to be very fast. So, so it tends towards infinity as r tends towards zero. So you're actually gonna end up, for example, if you ran straight over the nest, you have to have a hugely quick change in your angular estimate. 
So that's slightly problematic for, for the update equations. Secondly, if you use egocentric Cartesian coordinates, um, you have a similar problem, but now it, it has to do with how quickly X and Y will change. So basically if you use uh, at A and you rotate on the spot and you're keeping track of H in terms of X dash and Y dash, then you're actually going to, they're gonna be changing really, really fast. As you turn around, X will get very small and then very big, and then Y will get very small and very big. Um, so simply rotating on the spot, which isn't changing anything about your um, distance, you know, direction from home um, is actually requiring very, very rapid updating of your coordinates. And then for both egocentric and both polar, situations, you can see that the update equations actually require you to know your current position, your current vector state as input to update the home vector state. So they conclude from this kind of analysis that really probably the best system for any brain to use is actually to use Cartesian geocentric coordinates, because on any update step, you just need to know how you moved, and then you can put that in to update your current position. So your, your change in position only depends on what you just did. You're changing these coordinates. But the, obviously the problem then is you have to, if you have a geocentric Cartesian frame of reference, then you have to do some kind of transformation to control actually running home. Okay, so a model that was proposed quite some time ago, um, in 1995, before we had any clue really about anything that could be going on in the insect brain. Um, for path integration was proposed by Wittmann and Schwegler. And this is a hypothetical, they just hypothesize this neural circuit. And it's a circuit that uses redundant geocentric Cartesian encoding. So what I mean by redundant is that we have more axes than we need. We don't just have an X and Y axes, we have axes in, in multiple directions. So they, they hypothesize that there are, there are heading neurons tuned to different compass directions. And in the case of the insect, um, that's actually tied to cues in the sky compass. Um, and then that each segment of a route could be encoded um, in this sinusoidal form as a, as a kind of form of activity. Well, either you can think of it as the projection of your current, you know, your, your little vector that you're moving, you can think of it as the projection onto each of these axes corresponding to each direction, or you can think of it across all these heading directions as a sinusoidal encoding, um, sometimes called the phasor encoding of the direction where the phase of the sine wave uh, is corresponds to the direction that you're moving and the amplitude of the sine wave constant corresponds to the, to the length of this little seg segment, or you could have it correspond to the speed if you had a constant update time. Um, so, and then obviously, if you have another little segment of your journey, you can encode it the same way with the phase that corresponds to the angle and the amplitude corresponding to the length. And the, the idea is that for each of these directions, you're basically accumulating this activity. So if this activity is accumulated over time, so you're just adding, it's effectively adding together these sine waves and the addition of those sine waves will end up representing exactly the vector that is the sum of those vectors that you've represented. And so you actually have a vector that shows you the way home. So basically accumulating this activity corresponds to the vector sum. and um, here they've illustrated it with, with eight different directions. So eight act, act, the active activity in eight neurons. Um, this is, as far as I can tell, completely coincidental, but it turns out to be prophetic. Um, and they also propose not only that this is a way to actually get this path integration, but that also one way to, to then work out how to get home is to take this, this representation um, and shift it, you know, one column or two columns left or right, and compare how well that matches to the actual current compass direction. And that would let you know whether shifting to the left or the right matched better and which way you should go. But what's also nice about this, this form of, of encoding um, is that even though, as I said, it is really is a Cartesian encoding, 
you can still read off very directly the polar coordinates. So here you can tell if you want the polar coordinates of your home vector, the angle is the this lowest activity and the, ampli the, the distance um, is the amplitude of this wave. So roughly speaking, what I'm going to tell you is that we found almost exactly this mechanism to be what the insect is doing. And we managed to discover it effectively independently um, from first principles of the connectivity in the brain of the insect. So we actually constructed our whole model and then realized that we'd actually managed to construct the same model as they had described um, some 20 years earlier. Okay, so we were starting really from this. Um, this is the central complex. Uh, it's an area uh, in the center of the insect brain. And uh, it's being mapped in huge detail now, but um, one of the leading people to actually map this before all the kind of Drosophila connectome was built was Stanley Heinze um, at Lund University, um, who's been working on this system for a long time and has done all this beautiful staining. And this is exactly actually examples from the locust brain um, of the connectivity. And it looks like, you know, complete spaghetti. How can we ever work out from, from something like this what the functional connectivity in this brain area actually is and what is it doing? So, but we had a few good good clues to, to go on. And again, this came very much from, from Stanley's work. So he had identified that there are some neurons in the central part um, of this circuit that seem to get input from two particular parts of the central complex. So one part, which is called the protocerebral bridge, which is known to be responsive to the compass heading of the animal. And again, this was, um, many of you will have now have heard of this kind of compass encoding in the protocerebral bridge in Drosophila. Um, this was actually earlier work from Stanley where they used, rotated a polarizer above the animal to imitate the sky polarization pattern and saw that particular neurons responded to particular polarization directions and that there was this actually smooth mapping as you went along the protocerebral bridge, the preferred angle of polarization changed in a very regular way. So we knew that the information about the compass heading was there, that we had effectively these heading direction cells had, as had been hypothesized. And then uh, a bit more recently, um, Stanley also then recorded from neurons in the noduli of the central complex, which connect into the same neurons that I mentioned before. And these cells respond to optic flow. So here I'm sort of showing an example of simulated optic flow shown to, in this case, a bee. Um, and you can have it, you know, as though you're flying forward and the, the world is coming past you um, or vice versa. And in this case, this particular neuron was very responsive to front to back optic flow, not so responsive to back to front optic flow and also not responsive to rotational optic flow. And in fact, um, the firing rate of this neuron seemed to kind of move, change linearly with the simulated velocity of the optic flow. So it looks like a very nice speed input. So as I said, these are this is kind of one's coming in one end of the central complex, one's coming in the other end of the central complex, and they get integrated together by this set of neurons, which um, get both those inputs and therefore the hypothesis was that they could indeed be doing exactly this kind of accumulation of the rate of optic flow for the particular direction that you happen to be moving in. So that was the kind of first part of the story. Um, there's a little wrinkle in this in that um, the optic flow neurons actually had a preferred direction offset uh, by 45 degrees to the left and the right of forward flight. So they didn't actually prefer flight, an optic flow coming directly ahead, but from 45 degrees and 45, 45 degrees to the left and 45 degrees to the right. And the idea here is that this allows the animal to actually encode its ground 
its ground speed, its ground velocity, rather than just its speed. So basically, the idea here is that if the animal is is heading, its heading is in a particular direction, but its actual motion is maybe side slipping in flight, so its motion is slightly different. Um, then these two cells that respond at 45 degrees to the left and the right of its actual heading, it will be more strongly activated um, for the one on the side that it's side slipping to. In other words, it's like an orthogonal basis for its actual motion. And in fact, this um, idea has now been kind of confirmed um, in Drosophila in a couple of very nice papers recently in Nature that shown that Drosophila very similarly get input from the left and the right optic flow, and that they can use this to actually estimate their real ground speed in geocentric terms. Okay, so then the second hypothesis was that um, maybe the output part of this whole circuit could do the steering that we wanted it to do. So this is a picture that actually came from a paper that Stanley published um, before we'd built the model, but it basically showing, summarizing what he knew about the connectivity. And again, it looks kind of like spaghetti, but you can see there's actually quite a lot of order in there. So I've just told you about these compass neurons um, that give input and these speed neurons that give input and these neurons that get input from both of those. And then there's another set of cells which actually then connect out of the central complex to steering outputs. And they also get input from the compass cells, and they get input from these putative um, uh, integrator cells, but with this very interesting offset. So just to summarize, rather than trying to explain it with this complex diagram, we actually then tried to say, well, what's actually functionally going on here? So we used a force graph method to try and find what this connectivity actually is. And we were rather pleased to find that it actually really comes out as this ring for path integration and steering. And I want to emphasize that this is not now, you know, just a hypothetical model. Um, all the connections that are shown in this picture are connections we can justify from the neuroanatomy of the animal. So we literally, Stanley gave us a list of what the connections are, and then we put it in a force graph, and this is what we got. Um, so the key thing here, now we have the a central ring, which is showing you the heading direction cells in green. And then in the middle, we have what we're calling the memory cells. And these memory cells get this input from the speed neurons. And um, so you can see that they sum up. And so we, we hypothesize that they are summing up the speed for that particular direction. And then half of them, the light orange ones in this picture, connect across to rightwards to an, um, to an output cell that's called the left. So they kind of get shifted clockwise and connect to these output cells. And then the other half of these cells, the dark orange ones, are shifted anti-clockwise and connect to the, to the other cells. Okay, I think I've got my light blue and dark blue mixed up here, so sorry about that. Um, but you can see, so all the cells um, labeled R, which are the right output cells, um, get output from one of these clockwise shifted memories, and all the left ones get out, um, input from the, the clockwise, anti-clockwise shifted memory. Okay, and then these cells, output cells also get direct input from the heading direction. So, so they get information about their current heading direction and memory shifted to the left and memory shifted to the right. So basically what they do is that they're comparing the current heading to this left and right shifted memory. And so if the memory matches better when you shift to the left, then that tells you you should turn left. And if the memory matches better, if you turn to the right, you should turn right because you're trying to go back in the direction that your memory has stored. So they basically, the, the global output of all the left cells versus all the right cells tells you which way you should turn to match your current heading to the direction you want to go. 
So let me just show you um, a little video of this happening. Um, sorry, that's the end. Okay, so this is the, the bee flying out. And you can see that the direction that it's heading is always kind of encoded in this inner ring. And the further it goes in the opposite, uh, further it goes up, the more the memory accumulates in the opposite direction because these are inhibitory cells. Um, and then when it wants to go home, it's being the left and the right cells are being activated continuously to steer it directly back home. And it also, once it gets near home, the balance of memory will be very equal. So then it will tend to, to loop around home. Um, and the further away it gets from home, the more it is inclined to come back again. So I get a search behavior that occurs as well. Okay. So that was maybe quite quick, but um, I'm hoping there's still time to get on to some of the kind of more developments that we've done with this. So one thing we've done is to actually test this um, on a flying robot. So this is work by my student, Jan Stankiewicz, um, where we had a downward facing camera on a gimbal and using that to, to detect the optic flow. So it looks a little bit like this. You can see the optic flow and we have two matched filters looking at the 45 degrees right and left. And we use that to try and extract this estimate of the ground speed. And we found we had to include some information about the depth as well. And the upshot is that provided you have some head stability, then you can actually get quite an accurate estimate of your X and Y displacement from this optic flow over the natural ground. And then um, flying this with the neural circuit that I showed you, controlling the, the robot. So it's going out on a, on a path with some wobbles in it and a few sharp turns. Um, it's then able to find its way back over these long distances. And this is in quite uh, relatively windy conditions and, and natural scenery below it. Um, and we can measure, you know, the displacement, the error with distance flown, and in various tests, um, but in this case, the one to notice is the one in blue, which is the actual outdoor tests. Um, over 150 meters, we get only a few meters of error in the return. Okay, so let me go on then to the vector memory. So if you recall, I said that when the ant gets back home again, um, it's actually, when it gets home for the first time, it's actually able to go straight back out to where it found food. So we realized that we only needed to do a very tiny change um, to the circuit to be able to have it do this behavior. Um, so basically the, the idea is this, is that when it reaches the food, it stores the current state of its path integration. So that's uh, these, these memory cells, there's 16 of them, there's 16 values. So it just stores those 16 values saying this is where home is. And then it goes home to the nest. So its path integration goes down to zero. And then it wants to go back to the food again. So what it does is to take this memory that it's stored and use it to inhibit its steering cells. So that makes it, it's as though it's imagining it's now, its path integration is now the opposite of what it was. Um, and it's gonna move the whole steering system. We don't have to change anything. It's now automatically going to drive the animal until there's a balance between its current path integration and this memory. And that will, they will cancel out when it's back in exactly the place that it stored the memory. So this central complex circuit will steer the insect till the path integration minus the vector memory equals zero. So the insect is back at the food location. And we hypothesize this memory could maybe be stored. Um, for example, there could be a, a single neuron with, with a number with 16 synapses that store, when, when it gets the food, store that activity as, a, as weights that it can then use in the future. And we did various simulations to show that that could work even for very complicated outward paths. Um, if you found the, sorry, from the nest, very complicated outward path to the food, um, then you would go straight home and then you would go straight back to the food again. And what's nice about this is that it also allows the animal to take shortcuts. So 
this is kind of illustrating again what I said before that you go out from home in a search path, you find the food. When you get to the food, you store this vector memory and then you use your normal path integration to get home again. And when you get home, you now inhibit your whole system with this vector that you stored. So it's as though you imagine that you're now in this location and you're trying to use your path integration to go home again, which means you you home until those two things balance out, but seen as you actually started at home, you will have traveled back to the food. And if you reach the food and find that there's actually no, no food there, well, then you can always uh, release this inhibition so that you're, you now have a correct path integration. And for example, you could say, well, now, instead of going home, I'm going to recover some previous vector memory. So you now have your path integration is, says you're here, which is where you are. It's correct. You're now trying to get to this place. So you now use, you inhibit with that vector memory. So again, it's like you're doing this imaginary displacement and you're now going to try and use your central complex to drive you home again, which means you would take this path. And seeing as you're actually starting from this food, you will take a shortcut directly to the second food location. And again, we did various simulations to show that this, this actually works very nicely in practice. And this kind of vector memory can, can get quite complicated in, in some animals. So in um, bumblebees, for example, here, um, they've been shown to gradually, if they, if they go out to get food, they will actually pick up food from several places before they go home. And so as they gradually discover different food locations, Initially, they'll discover them randomly, but then each time they come out, they'll start to take a more efficient route around those. Um, so it's not it's not quite a solution of the traveling salesman problem, but it is it's a very uh, a short route. So that some of them will go clockwise and some of them will go anti-clockwise, but they'll take a quick route between them. So we hypothesize that maybe our circuit could do the same thing. All we need to do is store multiple vector memories and then make a choice between them for which one to activate at any point in time. So this behavior, which is called trap lining, we basically explore and we store a vector memory for every food source that we find. And then when we get to a particular food source and we want, to, if we want to keep it going, we don't want to go home yet, then we would cycle through all the vector memories. And for each of them, as I said before, you can tell by the amplitude of the sine wave, which one is closest, okay? Because once you, when you load the vector memory, you get this difference between the, the current path integration state and the vector memory. So the one with the smallest amplitude is the closest vector memory. And so you can head out and go to that one. And in this case, we would exclude a vector memory that you had already visited. So here I've just kind of illustrated, this is kind of multiple neurons, each of them with a different vector memory and you, you cycle through them until either one distance falls below some threshold and so you decide to go all until you find the, the shortest one and again uh, in our simulation we were able to get very similar behavior to the to the bees that they would you would gradually discover each of those food sources and then your route would get more and more efficient until you actually took the shortest path around um and what's very nice is that uh, recently uh, Stanley has actually discovered a neuron that seems to be exactly have all the properties we want for these vector memories and this is a neuron that's actually not found in uh, the fly in Drosophila but is found in specifically in bees so it's a neuron that uh, is external to the central complex and then comes in and uh, has synapses along all the fan-shaped body, which is the area where these memories should be interacting to do the steering. And there's a whole set of them, them each of them similar, um, but a whole set of them as though there's multiple different vector memories. So this is really nice, very recent data that suggests that maybe this hypothetical solution is actually really implemented in the bee brain. Okay. So in the remaining time, I think um, just given time constraints, I might uh, skip this one, which is about 
uh, vector addition, but I hope you can appreciate that we can easily do vector addition and we can actually use that as also to integrate different cues and to integrate different cues with different weighting by basically having the amplitude of the sine wave correspond to the reliability of the cues. Um, and then just to talk very briefly about uh, recent work that we've been very interested in, which is whether we can also use this circuit to explain honeybee dance. So hopefully many of you will know that bees are able to communicate to other bees a vector pointing towards a food source. So if one bee has discovered the food, it can, by doing a little dance in the hive, um, can communicate the distance and the direction that the other bee should go to find this food. And this is something that's actually evolved, we think, um, or this is a kind of possible evolutionary development for maybe the bees initially just following, one bee following the bee that knows the way, to species that actually dance in outside the nest um, and are basically pointing directly towards the source. So it's as though they're taking off towards the source, but then they don't, so it gives the direction. And then you have species that actually have do this in the open, but but on a vertical nest. And then the more famous ones, the, the honeybee that we're maybe most familiar with, they actually are inside a cavity or inside a um, hive, and they do this dance relative to gravity, and that corresponds to the angle relative to the sun. So we've been thinking about whether um, the same circuitry could could do the job. So our, our hypothesis is that indeed that, you know, if the animal has has done foraging and homing and it has a vector memory that it could use this kind of instead of flying back to the food using its vector memory, it could do a very kind of truncated or minimized version of that where it basically moves in the food direction using exactly the same steering circuitry and then it removes that vector memory and that will take it back to the start and then it will go forward again and come back again and so on. And then the big question, of course, is how do other bees interpret this? And this is where our, our research is currently going. Um, initially, we were thinking that maybe, you know, nest mates, if they follow the first bee, then they could be charging up their vector memory by in the in the right direction and by the activity of the bee that's going in front of them. Um, but in fact, it appears that bees can even learn this vector memory or transfer this vector memory, even if they're at an arbitrary angle compared to the dancer. So our current hypothesis is that they're actually potentially using the angle of the antennae um, and transforming that relative to a gravity vector to extract the vector of the dancer and then also getting the distance from the um, duration of the waggle vibration. So that's that's all work in progress. So I'll go to my conclusions and then hopefully there's some time for questions. Um, so what, what I found quite entertaining or enjoyed a lot about this work was that we, we actually were connecting, you know, this natural navigation behavior to neural mechanisms. And obviously, it's very hard to have natural navigation going on while you're trying to do direct brain recordings um, or direct manipulations of, of brain mechanisms. So modeling here was absolutely key to be able to link what we knew about the neuroanatomy and some of the neurophysiology of this system to the actual behavior in the field. And we could at least demonstrate the plausibility of, of different algorithms to be implemented in an insect brain. Um, as I've argued that the structure of the insect central complex suggests it's, it's a kind of almost a general computational mechanism for controlling and combining directed actions by manipulating vectors in the form of sinusoidal activity across the columns. And this allows the animal to flexibly adapt and maintain directed behavior towards distant desirable goals and even transfer this information to con specifics. And the big open question, I think, that we still haven't really solved, and I'd be really interested in any input on, um, is what, what is really the physiological basis of this path integration and vector memory? Because in both cases, the animal has to update the memory very fast, um, you know, essentially instantaneously update the memory, but then the memory has to be very, very stable, um, because they can remember, you know, these 
food locations for several days, for example. Um, so we really haven't got much idea at the moment about what kind of change could be going on. And it has to be, you know, at a very small circuit level at the synapse level or individual neurons or very small circuits because there just aren't that many neurons in the brain of the bee or the other insects to do this. And I'll just finish by, by saying thank you to all the people who have worked in my group and, and are currently working in my group, um, the ones in white, um, and then also to my collaborators and of course my funders. And thank you for the opportunity to present this work.